So turn with me again this morning to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Our study of the unfolding of God's plan of redemption resumes at fifth, verse 15. So we'll go ahead and turn there, verse 15. Thus far you'll recall that Moses has been up on the mountain. He has received instructions from God concerning the building and the furnishing of the tabernacle, the ordination, consecration of Aaron and his sons to serve as his priests, including the clothing that they were to wear and performing their priestly duties. Uh, he also received instruction concerning the identities of the particular craftsmen who were to be employed in creating all of those things that were required uh, in the temple, those things that uh, warranted their impeccable skills in each of those respects. At the close of chapter 31, after God had given Moses all of these instructions, uh, he gave him the two tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments written by his own hand. Uh, meanwhile, back at the Israelites' camp below the mountain, having grown impatient for Moses' return, uh, the Israelites demanded that Aaron make a god, little g, of course, who would go before them in Moses' absence. Aaron then collected all of the gold earrings from the people, uh, melted them down, and fashioned a golden calf that he announced as the god who had brought them up from the land of Egypt. Once again, this was... Uh, as we saw last time, this was not so much a violation of the first commandment, although it was that. It was more a violation of the second commandment. Now, how did we deduce that? Well, you'll recall that Aaron named this particular idol Yahweh. So this was really a graven image that was made to facilitate the worship of the Israelites in their worship of the Lord, Yahweh, the one true God. Uh, again, it's still a violation of both of those commandments because it is a God that they are placing before the one true God, and it's also uh, a representation in graven form of our one true God. So, in verse 5, uh, that's where we read that Aaron made that proclamation, "...tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh or to the Lord." I think Aaron was probably declaring this feast uh, partly out of guilt. He knew what he had done. Maybe he thought that having a feast to this God would actually impress God. Uh, maybe it would take some of God's judgment off of him. Uh, we don't really know, but he declared that a feast be made to Yahweh or the Lord. Uh, again, though, it was still wrong. He shouldn't have done it. And he's about to find out from Moses himself just how wrong this particular uh, scenario was. Uh, verses 9 and 10 is where God says, I've seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now, then let me alone that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. Of course, Moses then pleaded with God not to do uh, what God was threatening here, and we're told that God changed his mind, which as we discussed last Lord's Day, is simply an anthropopathic way of explaining uh, God's sovereign plan uh, that was going to take place anyway. God does not change his mind. God cannot change his mind because he is immutable. And in addition to being immutable, we know that God is impeccable, meaning he's perfect. So for him to change at any time, even with regard to changing his mind, would render something about him imperfect at some point, and we just can't have that. Uh, and so we must view this uh, as an anthropopathism or a way of expressing God's own actions through the use of human emotions. It's God's way of condescending to us, helping us understand something about him that we might not otherwise understand. This brings us to verse 15. Read along with me. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. 
The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. But he, that is Moses, said, It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. Now just stop there. Uh, Moses, again, having received the tablets of God's law written by God himself, comes down from the mountain, and Joshua hears what sounds like an invasion, uh, a lot of noise, a cacophony of activity going on in the camp. And it's clear from what Joshua says here that he wasn't with Moses when God told him about the Israelites' rebellion, so he assumed that what he was hearing uh, must have been a war or a rebellion of some kind uh, encroaching upon the Israelites. As Moses turned his own ear to the camp, though, he determined that it wasn't a war, but the sound of celebration, the sound of celebratory singing, the sound of joy for some reason. Verse 19, it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. So what Moses saw as he approached the Israelites' camp probably felt like a kick in the gut, right? You'll recall back in chapter 24 that when Moses was called upon the mountain by God, he very carefully reminded the Israelites of all the words that the Lord had spoken to him and the ordinances. And as we read in chapter 24 and verse 3, all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Remember, their resolve is quite impressive. They hear the ordinances, they hear the words of God, and they're, they're like, right on. We're going to obey like no one's ever obeyed before. Moses then offers sacrifices on behalf of the people. He takes the book of the covenant. He rereads it. And once again, they respond by saying, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And yet, as soon as Moses came down from the mountain, with the codified law of God in his hands, what did he find? He found the people engaged in idol worship. He found the people doing exactly opposite of what they said they would do. Remember, he's already read the law to them. He's already recited the ordinances of God to them. He's already reminded them twice, and we have reason to believe it was probably more often than that that he was reminding them of these things, even though it's not written. But Constantly, they're being reminded to do the will of God, and when he comes down from the mountain, he finds them engaged in idol worship, and who knows what other kind of debauchery. And here's the thing. In almost every case where the Word of God has been clearly expounded, and at least initially warmly received, it's never too long before Man grows lax in his devotion. Some of you probably remember as young believers, um, you would get on these, these highs, as it were. You would have these, these great moments where it seemed like your faith was impervious. You heard a, a really good sermon, you heard really good singing, or you engaged in really profitable worship, and you're on this high, you're on cloud nine as you leave the church. Uh, hopefully that happens when you're here every week. Uh, but what happens as the week progresses? This is why we need this weekly meeting, by the way. It's like a filling station. We come in and, and get a recharge or a refill of uh, the Holy Spirit, as it were. Corporate worship is extremely beneficial in promoting individual piety. And sometimes we forget that. But all it takes is to get out into the world or get stuck in traffic or, or you know, any number of things that can happen to us throughout the week, argue with our spouses, argue with our families, 
it doesn't take long for that high to wear off and we come crashing back down to reality. And this is just true in almost every case where we have these highs and lows. And it was certainly true in Israel's case. And let me just say this. This can happen even among Christ's most devout disciples. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about our resorting to idol worship and debauchery. I'm not talking about that. Hopefully none of you resort to those things. But we can grow weary as we wait upon the Lord. How many times do you pray? And Sometimes the Lord just says, wait, over and over and over and over again, and, and you grow weary of praying about that thing. Uh, you wonder, as we talked about last week, how long, O oh Lord, before you take action relative to whatever it is I'm praying about? How long, O oh Lord, will you wait in returning to get us? It's been 2,000 years, and we're still waiting, and we will wait still, most of us, uh, we'll probably die waiting for the return of the Lord. So it's very common to lose heart if we're not careful, if we're not constantly reminding ourselves from the Word of God about all these promises, about the real substance of God-given faith and the indwelling Holy Spirit who manages that faith and gives us the assurance that we need daily as we continue to walk with the Lord. I believe that one of the primary reasons that so many churches in our day are becoming more and more entertainment-driven is because they believe that the kind of worship prescribed in the Scriptures has become outdated. It's old. It's stale. And the only way to keep the people of God enthused about God, at least in their way of thinking, is to entertain them is to provide all kinds of flashy approaches to ministry in an attempt to discover something that works. Pragmatism is alive and well in a good number of local churches because they've determined that whatever uh, means are necessary to achieve a particular end, it's okay, whether scriptural or not. We're going to pursue that thing because that thing keeps people coming. I've read various accounts to you from articles written in uh, Christian periodicals like uh, Christianity Today, Today and, and other periodicals that um, tout these mega churches and how they achieve the success that they achieved. You'll remember not too long ago, I read something about a church down in uh, Corpus Christi um, that said in order to keep the people coming, you have to get better and better at entertainment. And again, it, it's just a misguided approach. And it's not only that, it's a violation of the regulative principle of worship. God's Word tells us how we are to worship Him. God's Word tells us that the true people of God will worship in a certain way as prescribed by the Scriptures and will avoid deviating from that way at all costs. Now, this is not to say that we do things in this church that are not necessarily governed by the regulative principle. The regulative principle doesn't tell us, for example, how we're to collect an offering. It doesn't tell us uh, where to put the pulpit. It doesn't tell us what color the carpet should be. It doesn't... There are things that aren't included in the regulative principle, but the regulative principle very much says that we, at the very least, should encourage one another with uh, hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs. We are to be engaged with one another on a deep level when it comes to understanding the Word of God through discipleship, through the preached Word of God. We're to engage with one another in routine fellowship, uh, and so on and so forth. And we do those things, but we don't seek to bring in the flashy, the newfangled, the, the most impressive things just as a means of keeping people engaged. The Word of God should do that. The Word of God, rightly divided, responsibly applied in our lives, should have that effect on us. And if it's not having that effect, what you really have are a bunch of people pretending, uh, playing the part hypocritically of being genuine believers when they're really not. 
Now, again, this is not to say that some preaching can be really dull, really boring. Some of our singing is not that impressive. And, but we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't abandon these bedrock scriptural principles trying to find the latest thing that works. We just simply cannot do that. Why? Well, again, to do those things is really tantamount to what Aaron did on behalf of the Israelite people. We can, if we're not careful, we can erect various idols in our own lives that are intended to promote and sustain our worship, but which are idols nonetheless. Um, Any time that we deviate from the clearly revealed Word of God in pursuit of other things, things that we deem to work better than the Word of God, we run the risk of losing everything. And many churches have gone that way. Uh, I believe that this is really what Spurgeon was dealing with in the late 19th century in England. Remember the articles that he and his associate uh, Robert Schindler posted in The Sword and the Trowel. These articles were entitled The Downgrade. Why? Because Schindler and Spurgeon saw that the Church of England and churches in England were going downhill at breakneck speed in their departure away from the Word of God. Um, Let me just read one of the things that Schindler noted. I've read some of the stuff to you over the years, but this is something that I've not read to you yet. But one of the things Schindler noted uh, was that some who had abandoned the faith did so openly, but many purposely concealed their skepticism and heresy, preferring to sow the seeds of doubt while posing as orthodox believers. Listen to what he wrote. He said, These men deepened their own condemnation and promoted the everlasting ruin of many of their followers by their hypocrisy and deceit, professing to be the ambassadors of Christ and the heralds of His glorious gospel. Their aim was to ignore His claims, deny Him His rights, lower His character, rend the glorious vesture of His salvation, and trample His crown in the dust. Within only a few decades, he says, the Puritan fervor that had so captured the soul of England gave way to dry, listless, apostate teaching. Churches became lax in granting membership privileges to the unregenerate. People who were strangers to the work of renewing grace nevertheless claimed to be Christians and were admitted to membership, even leadership, in the churches. Are we not seeing the same thing happen today? Whoever would have imagined only 10, 15, 20 years ago that we would have churches whose main claim to fame is that we welcome homosexual members as members, and not only that, we have homosexual pastors leading those congregations. And this is not something that's in the shadows anymore. This is something you drive by churches, especially in bigger cities. You drive by churches during June, and it's not uncommon to see the rainbow flag hanging outside of churches. How did we get there? Well, we got there because, again, people masquerading as genuine believers infiltrated certain churches and were able to convince everyone around them that this was normal, that this was going to propel them to greater heights of success. If we'll just dispense with all of the prejudice, all the bigotry, and welcome everyone with open arms, then we'll be a lot more successful in terms of how we humans measure success. In the process, though, they're actually proving themselves to be synagogues of Satan and not churches at all. And that's tragic. And yet you see it more and more frequently uh, with each passing day. Schindler went on to write in conclusion of this Uh, article, he said that these facts furnish a lesson for the present times when, as in some cases, it's all too plainly apparent men are willing to forgo the old for the sake of the new. 
But commonly it is found in theology that that which is true is not new and that which is new is not true. So true. We need to avoid like the plague, jump, jumping on every bandwagon that comes around that promises something better, promises something new and fresh, promises something successful. Folks, there's nothing, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing going on in the church at large today that men have not tried in successive generations past over and over again to bring new life into the church. In most every case, it ends in a decrease in the church's effectiveness. Just because it's old. See, and this is what I, I really recoil against the most. There's a prevailing opinion among many today that the old is actually responsible for the predicament that much of the church is in today. It's that old, stale, archaic, out-of-date sort of approach to ministry that hasn't worked. Well, again, let me just remind you, the Lord Himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell itself won't prevail against it. We're being assaulted daily by all of these things. Do we bow to them, or do we just continue down that straight and narrow path that leads to life by promoting the Word of God and the Word of God alone as our guide for all faith and practice? What was the trigger, though, at least in 19th century England? What was that straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, that caused this series of articles to be written? And why am I mentioning it this morning? Well, I'm mentioning it this morning because, again, we're repeating history in large measure. So the same trigger that warranted all of these articles, that same trigger is locked and loaded today and is being pulled routinely. Now, what is that, though? I've shared this with you before, but let me just remind you what Schindler said about this catalyst or what the cause was. He said, The first step astray is a want of adequate faith in the divine inspiration of the sacred scriptures. All the while a man bows to the authority of God's word, he will not entertain any sentiment contrary to its teaching. To the law and to the testimony is his appeal concerning every doctrine. He esteems that holy book concerning all things to be right, and therefore he hates every false way. But let a man question or entertain low views of the inspiration and authority of the Bible, and he is without chart to guide him and without anchor to hold him. He says, in looking carefully over the history of the times and the movements of the times of which we have written briefly, this fact is apparent, that where ministers and Christian churches have held fast to the truth that the Holy Scriptures have been given by God as an authoritative and infallible rule of faith and practice, they have never wandered very seriously out of the right way. But when, on the other hand, reason has been exalted above revelation and made the exponent of revelation all kinds of errors and mischiefs have been the result. Now, what does any of this have to do with Exodus 32? It has a lot to do with Exodus 32. Moses, no doubt, optimistically, perhaps even naively, believed that the Israelites would remain true to their word, that they would obey whatever they had been taught by way of God's ordinances, by way of God's Ten Commandments, Moses probably fully believed that when he came back to them from his meeting with the Lord on the mountain, that they would have kept their word. They would be living in accordance with what God had revealed to them through him. Instead, he found the people doing their own thing, and in the process, sinning horribly against their God. And this pattern of sinful disregard for God's commands continued, did it not? All the way through the New Testament. You know, Paul finally explains it in his letter to the Romans, but all the way through, even until Paul's day, the Jews had been blinded. 
The Jews had been given over to a spirit of stupor. The Jews were known primarily as an obstinate and stiff-necked people, even to the extent of rejecting and crucifying the Messiah. It's well documented that the Jews throughout their existence, and we're going to see this as we go through the Old Testament, the Israelites were never, nor have they ever been, a pattern for true believers today. Now note very carefully, I say the Israelites. I'm not talking about Israel. We know that true Israel, again, from mainly from Paul's letter to the Romans, we know that true Israel is identified as the children according to the promise made to Abraham and not the children of the flesh. That is, those who share a like precious faith, God-given faith, as that of Abraham, we are identified as spiritual Israel. Or as Paul said to the Galatians, the Israel of God. And again, that's not replacement theology, it's fulfillment theology. That's the way it was always intended to be. But this group of people throughout the Old Testament, known as the Israelites, they constantly reflect an attitude of disobedience an attitude of waywardness throughout their sojourning in the wilderness and beyond. And it's continued ever ever since, even among those who claim to be religious. As I thought about this, I was reminded of something that Jesus said about His second coming. Uh, Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, having just presented his disciples with the parable of the persistent or importunate widow, and having done that as a means of assuring them that the Lord will, in fact, bring about justice on the earth. Remember, this is that how long question. The Lord then says this, However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? John Calvin actually has something really interesting to say about this. Somewhat surprising, I believe, coming from Calvin. Calvin wrote this. He said, Christ expressly foretells that from his ascension to heaven until his return, unbelievers will abound meaning by these words that if the Redeemer does not so speedily appear, the blame of the delay will attach to men, because there will be almost none to look for Him. Would that we did not behold so manifest a fulfillment of this prediction, but experience proves that though the world is oppressed and overwhelmed by a huge mass of calamities, there are few indeed in whom the least spark of faith can be discerned. I mean, this goes hand in hand with what Jesus himself himself said about the two ways, right? Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go therein, but narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there are who find it. Going back to our text, how did Moses react? when he witnessed what he did among the Israelites. Verse 19b, Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to a powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Needless to say, Moses is not pleased, right? It's probably the understatement of the century. He's not pleased, so in a very symbolic gesture, he smashed the tablets of stone in much the same way as the Israelites had broken their covenant with God. And again, I think that is symbolic. I think he's saying, look, you're not going to abide by the covenant. You don't deserve what's written on these tablets. You have broken what's written on these 
tablets, and I'm going to demonstrate that by breaking them before you. Additionally, he ground the idol to powder. How he did that, I, who knows? We don't really know. And then, not only that, he scattered it over the water. He made the sons of Israel drink it. And what's all that about? Well, some have tried to connect this to the test for adultery uh, back in Numbers chapter 5. Uh, but in the absence of any connection made between this and that, we really can't be sure. Uh, you'll recall that back in Numbers chapter 5, there was a particular test where uh, something was ground up and they served the water, and I guess if you had a reaction to it, um, you were an adulterer. I, I don't know what that's all about, but I don't think there's a connection here. Verse 21, then Moses said to Aaron, and here's where things get really, I would say comical, but there's nothing really funny about any of this. But yet there is, if you read it properly, Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? And Aaron said, doing the backstroke here, right? Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> what gives, right? This sounds like something one of our children might say in response to what actually happened. But note here that Moses calls this a great sin. You know, this is not to say that we're to relegate all other sin to being less serious, although in a sense not all sins are created equal, but to demonstrate just how heinous of uh, heinous this sin of idolatry truly is. And I think we've talked about this enough in previous studies, so I'm not going to belabor it very much again this morning, except to say that what makes idolatry such an offense to God is that it expresses a profound dissatisfaction with the one true God and seeks to replace Him with any suitable substitute. And this goes back to what I was saying about the regulative principle of worship. Sometimes we find that the Word of God, as it regards how we're to worship God, is not sufficient. That we need more of this, that, or the other thing than the Word of God actually provides us. We need to be very careful, not only in the corporate sense, but in your own personal life. You need to be very careful that you're not creating idols. That you're not allowing anything into your own life that is intended to express some sort of dissatisfaction with what God has already blessed you with. We talked about this when we talked about, uh, from the 12th chapter of Job, we talked about the sin of discontentment. Discontentment in any form is egregious enough, but dissatisfaction with God Himself is horrendous. Especially when Paul tells us, through the Ephesians, he says, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What more do you need? The answer to that is we don't need anything. So next time you feel like there's more that you need in your life than Christ himself, remind yourself that Christ is your portion. That God's grace is sufficient that you have everything you need in order not only just to survive, but to thrive in the Lord. The problem is we're like the child at Christmas who has begged all year for a particular gift. They get the gift, and if they're small enough, before lunch is even served, they're playing not with the gift, but with the box that the gift came in. Right? Right? There's a spiritual parallel there. Don't miss the forest for the trees. You've been given the Spirit of the living God. You've been given God's own Son as a sacrificial atonement 
for your own sin. You've been given eternal life in Christ Jesus. What more could you even think to want? If you're just unfulfilled spiritually, you need to ask yourself why that might be. Could it be that you're playing with the box and not availing yourself of what's in the box? Could it be that you've so encumbered your life with all of the frills and fancy things around Christianity, but you've yet to hit the mark when it comes to thinking serious, deep thoughts about the God that you serve? And I, I, I've said this before about the various doctrinal hobby horses that people get on, right? Right? And yes, this happens most frequently in the area of eschatology. People these days are making more of eschatology than they are of theology, or soteriology, or pneumatology, or Christology. They want to know what your eschatological position is before they want to know what your soteriological position is, how you were saved from whom you were saved, from what you were saved, to whom you are being saved. They want to talk about what's possibly going to happen years from now as opposed to dealing with what's going on right now. And to that, I can only say, please, stop. Focus on living your life for Christ each and every moment of every day as opposed to looking into the future, trying to read the tea leaves, as it were, and find out when Christ is coming, what's it going to be like when He comes back, will we be ready when He comes back? The only way you can be sure that you're going to be ready when He comes back in the future is to be ready today. Focus all of your energy on living for Christ in a lost, dying, and watching world today. Now, why am I so vehement about that? Well, was it not James who said, do not say that tomorrow... He said, don't even say that you'll go to a different city tomorrow. Didn't Jesus Himself say, don't worry about tomorrow? Because today has enough troubles of its own? How are you living for Christ each and every day? You want the world to get better? You want to bring about the change that you so desire in the society in which you live? Get your head out of the clouds. Come back down to earth and do what you've been gifted and called to do in serving the Lord right now. Well, Pastor, it sounds like eschatology is really not that important. It's not. It's not. Especially given the reality that everyone in this room, likely, there's not a single person in this room right now, even the youngest among you, who will ever realize your eschatology. Am I right? I mean, should the Lord tarry? I hope He doesn't. I hope He comes back today. I hope he comes back before we even end this Sunday school lesson. But should the Lord tarry, as he has done, what should we be doing? We should be busy about the Master's work while he's away. Not squandering our time. Not sitting and wondering and drawing charts and, and all this stuff. Looking into the Scriptures to determine when he's coming back. We should be spending the talents that he has given us in a way that honors and glorifies Him now. Well, what was Aaron's response to Moses' question? He said, don't let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. Okay, we just read that, but let's break it down a little more here. Moses knew that, didn't he? Moses knew the kind of people he was dealing with. Just go back and read from the time Moses enters the scene here in delivering the people of, of God from 
Egyptian captivity, Moses knew at every turn he was being challenged. At every turn he was being disrespected. So he knew this. But look beyond that to what Aaron's attempting to do here. He's attempting to pass the buck. He's like, Lord, it's not my fault that these people are so prone to evil. It's all their own fault. They said to me, create for us a substitute. While this man Moses is away, we don't know when he's coming back, just create something for us. They gave me all their gold and earrings, and I threw them in the fire, and poof. Out came this calf. If it weren't so funny, we might just be able to see just how serious this is. Lies are never funny. Trying to pull one over on... God, through Moses here, is not funny. I believe I've shared with you the story of me burning the yard when I was a kid. Eight to ten years old. There was a guy down the street who was a welder, and he took a blowtorch, and he was burning his yard off. And that's what people did back in the fall and winter months to ensure that the grass would come back healthier. There's some science. Steve can probably tell you what the science is behind that, but... Anyway, you burn the yard off. And I thought, I bet my dad would love that. I'm going to do my dad a solid. So I lit the yard on fire. <laughs> and the wind started to blow. And if you've ever been in West Texas, it's not grass. It's, it's straw. The wind started to blow. Here I am, 8 to 10 years old, running around like a chicken with my head cut off, calling the neighbor kids over, come help me put this fire out. My 80-year-old babysitter, Mrs. Looper, comes barreling out of the house with a bedspread, my bread, bedspread, mind you. And I still have this vision in my mind of little Miss Looper out there with this bedspread and she's trying to douse the flames with this bedspread. Other neighbors come over and they bring their water hoses and everybody, it's, it's a mess. So my dad comes home. He's not pleased. But I thought I had a way out. He said, Tim, tell me what happened. Well, Dad, you see, we were playing baseball in the yard. And I slid into home plate. And there must have been a match on the ground. And I slid over that match. And next thing I know, there's an inferno in the yard. But we put it out, Dad. We saved the house. It wasn't a pat on the back I got. It was a little lower <laughs> and much more prolonged. That's the same kind of thing Aaron's doing here. He's trying to obfuscate. He's trying to, trying to soften the blow from Moses. He's saying, look, I just threw it all in the fire and poof. It's like providence. God gave us this idol just out of the fire. Well, needless to say, Aaron's explanation is implausible. He was guilty and he knew it, but his pride simply wouldn't allow him to take full responsibility for being so irresponsible. And I just want to ask you to be honest with yourselves. Do you sometimes do that? Do you sometimes water down the story? with your spouse, with your boss, with your co-workers when you've made a mistake and you don't want it to look like you've made the type of mistake that you've actually made, so you try to do the backstroke. Listen, don't do that. One of the telltale signs that you're a true believer is that you'll be a man or woman of the truth, even when it hurts. I learned a valuable lesson that day, and I can tell you honestly, as honestly as I know how, I never lied to my dad again. Let that be a lesson to all of us. 
We shouldn't lie because lying to our fellow man is ultimately lying to God himself. If David's right, and I believe he is, when he says to the Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned, then when we lie to one another, we're actually lying to God himself or attempting to. Verse 25, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourselves today to the Lord, for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. What in the world does all that mean? Come back next week. We'll talk about it. I mean, I didn't want to spend just a small amount of time explaining something that's really quite momentous in the history of not only Israel, but mankind. Why would God say, okay, everybody who didn't come over, who's not on the Lord's side, Kill them. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, in our next time together. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you so much for this teaching this morning. We, we thank you for the example that you've given us uh, in the Israelites concerning how not to behave. We thank you, Lord, that you have yet again proven that you are a long-suffering, patient, loving God, and yet you will not, you cannot tolerate idolatry. Help us, Lord, whatever our idols might be, even here and now, Lord, we pray that we might set those things aside, that we might commit, in some cases recommit our lives to serving you and you alone with each passing day in such a way that you're glorified and those around us are edified. Father, again, we thank you for this hour that we've had together. We ask, Lord, that you might grant us all the same unction, whether it be in the preaching or the hearing, uh, to be able to put your word into practice in such a way, again, as to bring you glory and honor in everything. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.